live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetWorksRadio.com presents David Walker, Kagro in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Wednesday, May 22nd, 2019. Time for another show, and I just realized I haven't opened any of the tabs that I usually have open in order to, you know, bring you the stories that uh, we we like to read you. we got got to read your stories to you here in the morning. And what else is there to do other than that? All right, just catching up here, making sure all the uh, various... Apps and tabs are open, and uh, we'll get a chance to catch up on those things. Daily Coast Radio is live now. Bill will help give us a short break to get some of those buttons pressed by relaying his Daily Coast Radio is live now morning tweet. Ben Carson joins me, KGROX, to discuss how sandwich cookies are going to solve America's public housing crisis while munching on a bowl of delicious, delicious lead paint chips. And I think... Maybe he had a bowl before he headed over to Congress yesterday. Did you happen to see this one? A uh, An interesting clip. Widely circulated yesterday. Uh, procedural fans, procedure fans will get a kick out of it. Uh, people who think Ben Carson is an idiot will get a kick out of it. People who think, uh, I don't know. I, I think everybody should get a kick out of this one. In fact, I think we should kick out Ben Carson because of this one. I guess he was up there for a hearing on who knows what. Uh, yesterday, and uh, you must have seen this thing by now. I'll have to dig it up in my uh, tweet stream. I retweeted it yesterday, too. But uh, you know what? I don't know what the thing that they were talking about is because that's not my area of expertise, but it's a real thing. And if you are the uh, head of the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, well, you probably should know about this. Uh, they were asking about uh, who was doing the asking here. I'll have to grab the story here. Uh, might as well start out with this one. Kathy Porter, who uh, whose name has come up before in these hearings. She, too, doing a fantastic job with her questioning in uh, committee hearings right along. I probably have seen clips of her questioning as often as clips of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So she's doing very well with these things. And uh, maybe she's distributing them. Her office may be uh, distributing the clips, which is a great idea and is available to all members. And they all uh, were envisioned as doing the same years ago when they outfitted all of the offices with, you know, modern communications technology. Uh, She's been making the most of it. She was questioning Ben Carson on various subjects and uh oh you know what was it this one yeah kathy porter was the one asking and and who else uh made a great presentation there was another congresswoman who later on in the day was likewise featured not in not in exactly the same way not in uh this strange and embarrassing way but having a, a a really strident uh disagreement over actually over carson's demeanor really, in the way he answered questions. And there were a lot of people that were pointing to this. He was very condescending, which was amazing for somebody who didn't know what they were talking about. But uh, the questioning was about, uh, that made the rounds, was Kathy Porter's questioning about REOs. And I have to slow it down so that you can uh, hear what we're talking about because it didn't occur to Ben Carson what they might be talking about. REO, apparently a basic housing term and lots of people on twitter uh knew exactly what was going on and why it was of concern not not within my purview i didn't really understand what was going on in terms of knowing what these things are but it's uh what is it Uh, real estate owned is that what it it is I, i just looked it up to be sure of the terminology real estate owned real estate owned or reo is a term according to wikipedia which might be incorrect, but, you know, uh, a term used in the United States to describe a class of property owned by a lender, typically a bank, government agency or government loan insurer after an unsuccessful sale at a foreclosure auction. So you can see where it might be something that comes up as an area of concern here and again. And uh, so Kathy Porter was asking Ben Carson about REOs and just paused, I guess, briefly to just make sure that he knew what they were talking about. Do you know what an 
REO is. And, and I don't know whether he was kidding, whether he was serious or what, but he professed to have heard her ask him whether she, whether he knew what an Oreo was. And I, we briefly, there was briefly everybody gasped, I think, at home. I, it didn't seem to occur to anybody in the room that you're not asking like a racist question here, are you? I, I, and I figured that by the afternoon, by late afternoon, the Republicans would have edited this thing down to just that exchange and then claimed that Kathy Porter was in fact racist. But no, she wasn't talking about an Oreo cookie. She was talking about an REO. You could see how the mistake could get made, except if you're the Housing and Urban Development Secretary, you would ordinarily have you'd be tuned into that if you ask me did i know what an reo was and i heard if, if i heard you right i would ask you if you were talking about reo speedwagon the band but be pretty sure that that's not what you meant um and then i would not know and i would say uh, no but if you're the secretary of housing and urban development you should key in on reo and say oh yes i do know what that is not you're asking not asking me about hydrox or uh el fudge or Milano's, or uh, for that matter, Nutter Butter Peanut Butter Sandwiches. All great sandwich cookies, no doubt, but not likely what you're going to be asked about in a hearing. So anyway, interesting clip, and uh, I'm glad you all got to see it, and uh, it'll give me a chance now that Greg Dworkin is here to look back and see who else it was who had been highlighted in having their exchanges with Carson. But he was really tuned out and condescending yesterday and he he may be that way all the time i don't know but it was it was really something oh the uh the part about it that was so interesting to procedure fans was i guess ben carson had seen during the course of the hearing the magic words reclaiming my time being uttered by various members of congress when he would start to ramble somebody ought to do greg should reclaim his time right now as a matter of fact but uh, he so he tried that one when he when the questioning got uncomfortable and he didn't like being pressed for a yes or no answer he, he tried to do that and he said he just blurts out reclaiming my time <laughs> and they were like you don't have time that's not something you get to do that's the the time belongs to members of Congress you're supposed to answer questions with it when you don't they reclaim their time they didn't bother explaining it to him but he, he laughed afterwards like he was clearly. He knew he didn't know what the hell he was doing, and that's not really supposed to be funny. Anyway, Greg Dworkin is here to claim his time. We'll really give it to him this time. Uh, oh, look, and uh, Vox is got, sending me this, a Vox explainer, yeah. why the they Oreo thing was so funny. It's in one place. You can put it okay. in your roundup uh, yeah. later. Right, if, you, if you don't know why it was funny, Vox will explain it. Mm. And you know, then it's not funny. But okay. Well, the thing the thing that is totally understand un, un, not understandable is why Ben Carson is in that position in the first place, and why oh, yeah. he's still there. Uh, we know the guy knows nothing. Yeah, the, 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 we know the reason is that, that Donald Trump said Urban. I don't care, I don't care about this cabinet oh. department. Just go and yeah. Like, well, that's the don't one. Bother me, okay? Just for the guy who builds I'll housing call you in four years. Yeah. Guy who builds housing, supposedly, or his dad, his dad built housing for a living. He builds nothing, uh, but his all his income comes from housing and uh, a huge chunk of his income still comes from section eight housing vouchers, but he doesn't actually care about, you know, the, the subject. He just, is this a way to get money? Then I, then I like it to that extent, well, but it, it, uh, Biden was right. Or if you prefer Biden's speech writer was right. Okay. You know, when, yes. when he said that, uh, what? uh, Donald Trump, uh, you know, squandered everything he inherited. He, he inherited, uh, the Obama Biden economy, and he's squandering <laughs> yeah, that true. just like everything else. That man, that's a good one. That's a good line. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think Ben Carson is there because Donald Trump saw Urban in the name and said, Urban, that means black. Get me one of them. Who do we have? Oh, one ran for president. All right. What was that guy's name again? Ben Carson. Well, Ben you Carson, know, you're go ahead. HUD. Dr. HUD over here. Say something nice about Trump and he'll appoint you to some cabinet committee. Yeah. I guess the next one up is uh, Ken Cuccinelli, who's going to yeah. run immigration uh, somehow. I guess so. Be an immigration advisor, they as couldn't if Stephen get, Miller uh, isn't enough. Yeah. They couldn't get Kobach past anybody any longer. So I guess that's... Well, you know, Kobach was demanding a plane. <laughs> yes. Oh, right. We never got things. to that story. It was amazing. This list. Of, he wants to be a czar of something. Uh, 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 Romania was taken, yeah. right? 
<laughs> so, <laughs> right. And uh, he is it, one of the, his demands was, yeah, access to a, a DOD or a DHS jet. So that twenty-four could, by seven with a uh, with the parenthetical explanation that he'll need to be able to fly to the border at all times. Which I mean, I don't know. If you were really going to be doing something, I would imagine transportation back and forth to the border. The, sure. The border but, of where? The border I, of France and Germany. Yes. The border. Yeah, I mean, what is he talking about? The border of Ka- of Kansas. He needs yeah. to. So I I have to have access to a plane twenty four seven. What a, what a demand! Just sort of amazing. I mean, it, if you need to go, you get to go. They don't. Right. You don't have to demand it up front, but uh, anyway, what a very diva. Weird. Okay. Very yes. Um, I was a little late in posting all of my listings that I was going to go with today. And actually, I'm going to be done at 930. I have some other stuff I have to do after that. But uh, when we posted on Daily Coast this morning, the Pundit Roundup, it turned out that we had done some coding uh, changes. And the comments were inexplicably closed for a half hour until tech got rousted out of their sleep. And, you know, he said, the coding stuff you did is great, but... It automatically turned off all the comments and anything new posted. You got to go fix it. Is is our so comments important to a blog? I don't. Well, know. it's what makes the blog. I mean, then, I, yes. I post stuff and I write stuff. But that's not important. Yes. What's important is the community discussion. Right. And uh, it's nothing without that, especially the pundit roundup in the morning, which is an open thread, and everybody likes to chat. Yeah. yeah and think... what are we chatting about? We're chatting about impeachment. Yes, a lot of people, more people than ever, including yes, members of Congress. Yes, and that's going to be uh, one of the two uh, pieces of things I discussed uh-huh. today. Uh, impeachment is like the tides, I wrote, inexorable oh. and on its own schedule. You can't, like, hurry it. You can't delay it. Can't explain it. Is it is what it is. How'd the moon get there? Exactly. Um, the, the moon got yeah. there because, uh, you know, uh, uh, we voted on it, that. right? I think so. It must. Uh, Nancy Pelosi said it was time. The, for the moon. moon was another star that was uh, designed by a committee. <laughs> that could be. That would be the result. Okay. Well, let's uh, see. Oh, you know, I need to. Okay, I'm opening but, up. But, all but my here's threads. here's the thing. Okay. Yes. So you have just the name Amish. That guy. Uh, who uh, I have this cartoon from uh, Nick Anderson. I love Nick Anderson cartoons. And uh, Justin Amish is holding up this giant book that says the rule of law. Oh. And Trump is yelling at him and says, loser. <laughs> and of course, under Trump's art, uh, uh, Trump's arm is a book titled The Art of the Conceal. Oh. And, you know, basically, uh, Trump is trying to stonewall everything and run out the clock. And the thing is, the more he does that, the more he drives Democrats to say, you know, this is ridiculous. Uh, Brad Moss, uh, who with Mark Zaid are high-powered D.C. lawyers who defend a lot of uh, uh, national security cases. Mm. So Brad Moss says, you know, I've been long skeptical of the idea of pursuing impeachment against Trump, at least without first exploring the obstruction angle further in hearings. But if Trump is going to prevent any meaningful hearings from happening, forget it. Open an impeachment inquiry. Okay. And that basically sums up people's reaction yesterday to uh, Trump saying Don McGahn can't uh, testify to Congress. Of course he can, but. You said he can't. The other thing that happened, and uh, it, it's interesting, uh, today I think that there's going to be a hearing on the Deutsche Bank uh, data that Congress requested. But at the same time, as we know, uh, the courts ruled that uh, Trump's financial firm has to hand over the tax information that's been requested. He'll appeal yep. that. But uh, the judge writing the opinion said, look, the chances of the Trump administration winning this is so low They've asked me to put a stay on this. There's no way. Not right. happening. Not, uh, I mean, the, the, the standard they usually ask for is you got to show me some substantial likelihood of success on the merits of your case. And yeah, I have none, looked so and no. Yeah, it was a it was a very well done opinion, but uh, I guess one that really could have What's been your guessed opinion, at. Man? Yeah, uh, I could have done that as a law school student. You read the law. And uh, you repeat it. And, and it, though it was a, a victory, um, it was a long time coming for something that was so obvious. Right. However, that's the way it works. And I have this really interesting uh, thread here I'm going to read to you. All right. Uh, and it gets to the point of setting the predicate for impeachment. You have to establish that. And uh, even people like uh, Steny Hoyer 
are uh, saying the divide and Democratic caucus over impeachment is that we're confronting what might well be the largest, broadest cover up of any administration in history, he says. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, we're just trying to do this deliberately. Okay. so here's the thread. Malcolm P. Johnson. This is in the Pundaranda, but I'll post it for you here okay. in the Skype so you can find it easy. It's always good. Easy is good. Easy is good. Okay. And he says, I'm not a lawyer. I like that because I'm it's not easy. a lawyer either. Right. But I have a particular view when it comes to impeachment. When I work for Warner Brothers Legal and Business Affairs, hmm. sounds like a division of Warner Brothers, Yeah. which itself is a division of Engulf and Devour. We had a simple guideline for pursuing litigation. First, we'd send the offending party a 30-day cease and desist letter. Yes. And when that didn't work, we'd send them another 30-day cease and desist letter. And if that didn't work, we'd send a third 30-day cease and desist letter. Yes. But on day 91 of that process, we'd initiate litigation. Inevitably, we'd be in court and the judge would say, OK, but have you given the offending party every chance to comply with your wishes? And we'd be able to say, yes, we have, Your Honor. Here's our first 30 days, here's our second, and here's our third. All documented, transmitted, all ignored by the offending party. And suddenly, we weren't the ones having to prove anything. It was the guys we were suing. The judge would look at them and say, so what about this, counselor? Why have you ignored their lawful request? So in terms of impeachment, we're on the second 30-day cease and desist letter, metaphorically speaking. The Democrats are bound for court and are now collecting documentation to show how much the administration is acting unlawfully. We're going after tax returns and by ways and means. We're going after bank records by intelligence and finance. We're going after testimony via judiciary and oversight, all of which we have a right to and all of which have been subpoenaed. So when you see the chairman of these various committees, quote, not going fast enough, end quote, remember, they're collecting documentation with each of these extended deadlines. When the Democrats face a judge, they'll be able to say, look, Your Honor, we gave the administration every chance to comply with the law. What you call slow and ineffective is what a lawyer would call crossing every T and dotting every I before going to court. Because it's a dead cinch lock that the judge will rule in our favor. Because what I expect to happen and what I think every Democrat expects to happen is Trump will then defy whatever ruling the judge hands down. And once that happens, once Trump defies the federal judge's ruling, which I expect to happen 100%, Well, the precedent will won't be on the Democrats. It'll be on the Republicans. So if you're patient, this is going to play out the way you want. Trump can't help himself. That was his view. I think it's really kind of a nuanced uh, approach here. Um, Other people take similar sorts of approaches to it. We know that the Amit Mehta, who's the judge who upheld the Dem subpoena for Trump financial records, sees it that way. And uh, Brad Moss sees it that way. And what's interesting is the Republican reaction to it. What they're trying to do is excommunicate Justin Amash, Mm -hmm. run a primary against him. The thing is, he's just as likely if they get too harsh to turn around and say, "Okay, I'm going to run for president on the Libertarian Party and I'll take all the non never Trumpers with me. And that may not sound like a lot, but. Uh, you know, the second part of my discussion is going to be about how badly Trump is doing in the polls. He mm-hmm. cannot afford that. Yes. Well, uh, I don't know if he'd be the guy to rally the vote, but uh, right now, I guess he would make a leading contender. And he's, the, I mean, he knows how to set himself up for it, certainly. Right. He's doing it now. Uh, Representative Jim Jordan, GYM Jordan, uh, was not exonerated by the Ohio State. Uh, review of everything that happened with that doc, Richard Strauss, who was uh, molesting uh, the athletes. Yeah. Representative Jim Jordan, the American people don't want impeachment. There's no basis for it. But the Democrats are so angry that our president is succeeding and so desperate to please their base, they'll do it anyway. Yeah, sure. Exactly. That's what he said. But notice what he said. The Democrats are so angry. Yeah. And Kyle Cheney points out, this is the reason Republicans are frustrated with Amish. He's the rebuttal to every talking point like this. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's they'll what... say, well, it's a bunch of 12 angry Democrats. Yeah. Well, Justin Amish isn't a Democrat. By the way, neither is Robert Mueller. Yes. Right. Uh, although there's <laughs> there's also the countervailing problem of people saying, well, we will uh, push for impeachment when it becomes bipartisan. OK, here it is. Uh, it is. I meant more. Right? But, more. but again, it, it's happening. I mean, yeah. impeachment mm-hmm. is a thing. It's it, it, The it ball gets thing. rolling. And then, you know, uh, it's the old FDR. I want to do it. Now make me do it. Mm-hmm. And that's what's happening. And uh, in, yeah. in the case of Nancy Pelosi, it's her caucus. 
Right. Uh, and of course, it's us making the caucus do it. And so, I mean, don't forget in all this, as many explanations and as many uh, good reasons as there may be for either going, moving deliberately, etc., don't let that make you lose sight of your role in all this. You're busy making them do it, and they are nodding in agreement silently right. behind the scenes. Keep doing the, the what other, you're doing. The other side of the, the coin, though, is uh, a very interesting comment by Michael Steele, not the ex-RNC chairman, but the ex-spokesperson for John Boehner. Ah, yes. Okay. Right? Who said, uh, this is an interesting position. John Boehner was in this position, and Nancy Pelosi will find out, he said. This was on MSNBC as one of his panel commentaries. Nancy Pelosi will find out if she doesn't already know that you can only fight your entire caucus for so long. Yes, that is true, and she knows that and knew it before John Boehner was speaker, but okay. Exactly right. Um, and, and the difference is she's far more skilled at it. So it looks like that uh, when she finally says, all right, we have no choice. I do this in sorrow, not in anger. I felt like I was forced into this position because you all know I didn't come at this as an angry Democrat. Right. I really tried not to do this. But now I have no choice. Um, that will stick because she's done a great job of setting that up. Yeah, I think so. And uh, I don't know whether that naturally actually, you know, I don't know whether you can interpret that as meaning that she's had a secret plan all along no, or it's just all. been, but, hey, but you just, know, she did a smart way. She yeah. did it the processed way and it's going to work out. I'm OK. And, you know, I'm OK with that. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I think she's resisting a little more than is absolutely necessary. But OK, as long as we get there and even if we get there with your complete disagreement <laughs> and you never change your mind. Eh, OK. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, so uh, let's see, who was it? It was uh, Dana Milbank who had a column today. Slow walking impeachment may look weak, but restraint is Democrats' greatest strength. Okay. And he talks about the uh, Jerry Nadler committee, I guess, where Judiciary. he had to show up. Yeah. There was only one side of the dais at Tuesday's House Judiciary Committee. The dais, really? It was like a, a bar mitzvah. Hearing that mentioned impeachment, and it wasn't the Democratic side. Only one side hollered and sputtered, one side that lobbed insults at the other and impugned colleagues' motives, and it wasn't the majority. Hmm. Indeed, Tuesday's hearing was a study in the asymmetric combat that defines our politics in the Trump area. Some on the left see this asymmetry as a sign of Democratic weakness. I see it as a nation's best hope for recovery. <laughs> yeah, but uh, there you go. They're correct, but screw, quote unquote, the left. Basically, basically what he's saying is Doug Collins is such an idiot. Uh, that after seeing him, you go, well, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. right. Watching this disparity in demeanor, I tried to imagine how things might look if Hillary Clinton had won the presidency. And two years later, five of her campaign advisors had been convicted of crimes. The prosecutor documented numerous instances in which Clinton had interfered with investigators. Clinton refused to let aides cooperate with subpoenas. She directed the Justice Department to investigate the front runner for the Republican 2020 nomination and directed the White House counsel to lie about her deceit and then ordered him not to testify. I have never heard that argument made. Right. Can anybody imagine the Republicans steadfastly resisting calls for impeachment? So there's a longstanding tension among Democratic lawmakers and 2020 presidential candidates about whether to answer Trump's aggression and insults in kind. But the massive voters side with the restraint and even anti-establishment Senator Bernie Sanders has said impeachment works to Trump advantage. Certainly Trump has earned impeachment. Republican Representative Justin Amash said as much, but with no chance of removing him, Democrats can instead... Show the country our problem isn't polarization. It's that one side has gone bonkers and the other side is trying to restore adult supervision. The point of that isn't that Milbank is right. It's that it's basically if the Saliza Milbank villagers are now seeing that this is where we're at, uh, then the impeachment idea is making progress. OK, the, these are some of the people that say that when uh, you're wrong, you know, you're right. But at the same time, they're acknowledging that, OK, well, I see where all of this is coming from and I see where this is going. I have my own opinion on it. But the bigger picture is this is where it's going. OK. And if they were beer, they'd be Budweiser. Something like that. These and of course, they'd okay. like to have a beer with you. But, you know, sure. it, again, it's it's uh, this is an Overton window thing. Mm -hmm. When you start talking about impeach now and everybody's explaining to you why impeachment should be slower. Yes. They're talking about impeachment. Yeah, well, that's true, too. As long as we throw him out the 
Overton and, and this stuff takes time. This is how it has to happen. This is why it's a tide. It's not a. It's not a tsunami. Yes. You have to have this discussion every day. Impeach. I'm hearing impeachment every day. I've been hearing it for two months now. Mm-hmm. What What is that about? Yeah, well, that's how it sinks I'll into the read. American population, not by a columnist or a Rachel Maddow show, excellent though it might be, talking about this is why we should do this. Uh, no, but it starts that way. So it starts. Well, it has started that way, and yes. so now you're starting to see it percolate. And yes, that's true. Good. Well, I think so, too. And it does take a while. It just takes a while. I mean, for a number of reasons, it takes a while. Uh, I, I would, I guess, offer this. Um, you're not – this isn't a a case of copyright infringement at Warner Brothers. I will point that out. I understand how things worked when you were a lawyer at Warner Brothers Legal Affairs. It's and he's not, not even a lawyer. That. Now, oh, is that right? Yeah, that's right. He started out that way. So uh, there you go. <laughs> I guess that makes the point even stronger. Um, if you wanted to accelerate the process, uh, who would you ask about that? Probably a lawyer. And if they say, you know, this could move faster, it's not absolutely necessary that we drag it out this way. Although, or, and also, by the way, if you talk to the lawyer's accountants, they'll tell you the reasons why they like a 91-day window too. Billable hours, not an issue here. Right. Anyway. But we'll do more point. of the polling stuff right after the break. We'll, we'll okay. do five minutes after that. Very good. All right. Yeah, we got a, a little bit here before we have to kick the music in. But I have seen others uh, suggest the same uh, the same strategy or the same explanation for what's going on, that uh, the Judiciary Committee is, is playing a lawyer's game, and it's an appropriate game to a certain extent that uh, th- they know from having appropriate game. yes it's having inappropriate it right. is appropriate an appropriate game and uh, they've been to court before and they know the judge's preferences for these 30-day warnings and 30-day notice for people who are going to be held in contempt and it's true there's a there's a process to it uh, although of course at some point you know you have to acknowledge that you're working outside of normality and that would be good too all right we'll be right back Hi everybody, it's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the K-Grow in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's uh, keep on going, Greg. We've got a uh, polling roundup next, right? We do. So the Quinnipiac poll came out, which put uh, Trump at 38% approval, uh, but also looked at where things stand with Democratic primary people and makes some uh, compelling points that I think people should keep in mind going forward. First of all, uh, Quinnipiac itself says the nation's economy is pretty darn good. And President Donald Trump's approval numbers are pretty darn awful, said Tim Malloy, assistant director of the Quinnipiac University poll. So what to make of the good news, bad news mashup and how to correct it? For the moment, the disparity leaves the president on shaky reelection ground. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, And one of the points that I was making on Twitter this morning is that really, if you look at the real clear politics average where. Trump was at 42.7 approve and 53.9 disapprove. His disapprove is really the more important number to look at. So I suggested stop looking at Trump's approval. It's stuck. It's not moving. It hasn't moved in a year. Okay. It's basically a straight line. Uh, let me actually copy and paste that image for you so that you could see it too. Uh, I could probably visualize it. It's a straight well, line. Well, there it is. Okay. Well, all right. Let's take a look. Okay. Uh, But Harry Anton uh, supported this with a tweet that I noticed after I had done that. And he says, early days yet, but the strong opposition to Trump's reelect remains historically high. Okay, Mm -hmm. so, for example, May 2019, where we are now, definitely vote against in the next election. Ooh, I like that. Yes. Fifty fifty four percent in comparison. 
Okay. okay. In May of 2011, Obama had 38 percent definitely vote against him. Trump is mm-hmm. at 54. George W. Bush had 31. Bill Clinton had 37. H.W. Bush at 21, Ronald Reagan at 36, Jimmy Carter had 30. Mm. Okay, that's, Donald Trump that's, is at 54. It's just a, astounding totally how kind of intense the opposition to Trump is. Yeah, well, if they're all telling the truth, uh, he'll lose. Exactly. And so that makes him not a lock to lose, but rather um, any discussion, including... Uh, uh, those that say, yeah, but the economy, it's the economy, stupid, needs to look at the Quinnipiac uh, data that I just presented. The economy is doing fine and Trump is doing terrible. The economy isn't going to win it for him. And it turns out there are pockets of the economy like the Midwest with his trade wars that aren't doing nearly as well as people think when they make the broad statement, well, the economy is good. So Jonathan Bernstein also has this piece today. Trump should worry about his approval rating. Nothing seems to sway the public's opinion of the president that straight line that I was talking about in real clear politics. Hmm. And that doesn't bode well for 2020. Uh, Or, or it bodes really well. More broadly, Trump seems to have lost half a percentage point in approval since 2018, a half a point in a year. Hmm. Right. For a normal president, a change that tiny wouldn't be worth mentioning. But for Trump, who has had incredibly stable numbers, anything that bumps him down even a little seems and maybe is more important. Trump's current approval rating is the second lowest of any polling era president through 852 days in office, beating out only Jimmy Carter. And as I talked about, his disapproval is actually worse than that. Mm, Right. Okay. As always, he'll say, I'll point out there's plenty of time for change. But when you look at Trump's numbers, they're not changing. The intense disapproval of him isn't all of a sudden going to go away because he says, okay, I'm sorry. I was just kidding. Yeah. Uh, Though he may try. So that said... Jonathan Bernstein writes, it's Mm -hmm. still true that there's never been a president, at least from Harry Truman on, as consistently unpopular as Donald Trump. It remains hard to see where he would find new support, and it's possible he has at least a soft ceiling at around 45. If that's true, it's going to take either an amazing fluke for him to win a second term, just like Comey and the Russians were an amazing fluke for the first term, or a lot of people voting for him while thinking he's doing a bad job. And people usually don't vote for a president while thinking he's doing a bad job. Mm, yes. They'll right. only do that if you demonize your opponent and make them unacceptable. Or if they are all Russian bots. Uh, who vote. Right. Or if you hack the vote. I mean, there's, there's a number of things that can happen, and elections are under siege. But uh, there's just no way you can look at all of that together and make the case that uh, Trump is on his way for re-election. In fact, just the opposite. Okay. Without guaranteeing a result, you can't do that. It's too early. I guarantee at, you can't. At the same time, the Q poll also looked at the uh, Democratic uh, uh, candidates. Uh, Biden was okay. down three points compared to the last poll, but that's well within the margin of error. And right now it's 35 percent Biden, 16 percent Sanders, 13 percent Warren. They're turning out to be the big three. Kamala Harris can make a move. She's still in there. But yeah. those are turning out to be the big three at the moment. Yeah. A lot of folks say Biden is about name ID, but not really. Harry Enten says he does best among those who are paying close attention. And okay. I'll give you those numbers. Uh, Ryan Strzok, uh, uh published those. He's a fascinating 2020 breakdown in the new Q poll by how much attention voters are paying to the race. And this is just Biden Sanders because we have a top two right at the moment. If you're paying a lot of attention, Biden 42, Sanders 8. If you're paying some attention, Biden 33, Sanders 19. If you're paying little or no attention, Sanders 28, Biden 23. (laughs) hmm. So I would argue if you're going to look at this, actually Bernie is where he is because of name recognition, not Biden. Yeah. And if you're paying no attention, (laughs) that doesn't sound that good. Right. Uh, Now there's some other numbers that aren't so good for Bernie. Bernie Sanders favorable rating among all voters in February 2016, 51 favorable, 36 unfavorable. And now... 41 favorable, 48 unfavorable. Uh, I think Biden's the only one that's above water there. So, uh, you know, what else? President Trump's approval rating was at 38% among registered voters in the new Q poll. Again, uh, those are not great numbers for Trump. And uh, this despite the fact that 54% of independent voters say they're better off financially today than they were in 2016. Mm -hmm. 
22% of voters say the economy is excellent. 71% say it's at least good. It's not helping him. Okay. Now, Trump's approval rating is at 70% among white evangelicals. You might think that's a high number. It really should be like 90. Uh, yeah, you would think. Right. Uh, among black voters, for just an example where you think it should be, President Trump's job approval is at 6% approve. Yeah. All right. That right. sounds right. 88% disapprove. Flip those numbers. That's where you think white evangelicals should be. You would think. And hmm. Of course, uh, <laughs> this is funny. Bill de Blasio, who, by the way, is mayor of New York City and decided to run for president. That is what he stands say. out in this poll. He's 8% favorable, 45% unfavorable. I hmm. would say those are not good numbers. I, yeah, I, I'd be surprised. I'd like to know where they even come from. I mean, where do the people know him? I, I could get those answers in, in New York, but is right. that national? Really? Uh, now, here's another breakdown Ryan Strzok gives on that Q poll. 2020 poll from Quinnipiac among very liberal Dem voters. Warren, 30. Sanders, 22. Biden, 19. Harris, 13. Buttigieg, 6. O'Rourke, 4. I have been making the case, as you know, on this show that I think Beto is fading. Booker won, Klobuchar won, everybody else under one. But the point there is among very liberal Dem voters, Warren actually is 30 and Sanders 22. Huh. I think she's making a move with her segment of the population that she needs to in order she to is. be in, in a position to run. Well, putting her up in the uh, near and to the top tier has been uh, the development of the, of the last two weeks of the fortnight. We, we award you development of the fortnight. Right. New 2020 poll from Quinnipiac award. by race. White okay. voters, Biden 32, Warren 16, Sanders 13, Harris 9, Buttigieg 7. Huh. Non-white, Biden 39, Sanders 21, Warren 8, Harris 7, Booker 3. Hmm. Strong showing for Sanders there. I know that's a complaint for a lot of people. Right. So, you know, that's... Uh, improvement. Is that name recognition? Is it improvement? Well, well Oh, I don't see. know. Yes. Remains uh, to be seen. But oh, Biden well, is, good, you know, Biden know. is doing what he needs to do in order to keep the front runner status. He hasn't faded immediately after, uh, right. you know, getting in the race. It's not so surfing. I think it surprised people that he stayed where he is. Uh, but we'll see. OK. Well, you know, at this point, staying where you are is uh, OK, because it's uh, 200 years until the election. Right. Anyway, that's it for my segment for oh, today. I'll okay. be back tomorrow, but we got some stuff to do. All right. And, uh, you know, so does Congress. So we'll see how they, they yes. handle it. Yes. Uh, oh, Bill, uh, Bill in Portland uh, has a, a guess at what stuff you're doing. Have you seen yeah. this? Well, is is that right? That's part of it. Can we can we announce that publicly? Sure. All right. Uh, happy birthday, Craig. There right. you go. It's my 65th birthday today. Ta-da. That's pretty so amazing. So I'm officially a senior. That's right. All right. right. I'm not just a boomer. I'm a senior. Yes. So now I'm an expert on all things senior and how seniors think. Right. So you're going to dinner is what you're saying. Uh, I like the early uh, <laughs> early bird special. OK, good. Uh, have dinner have at 10 a.m. You get a real break on price. <laughs> and then also, a movie. you can sit wherever you want as long as it's near the kitchen behind a pillar. <laughs> all right. Well, have a have a great day. Come back tomorrow and uh, tell us what you I'll got be older for presents. Tomorrow, so I'll be older yeah. and wiser. We'll see how That's, that goes. Wow. Well, okay. Older, you bet. And a collection listen, of very wise stories. We know that. So listen true. to your elders, David. Okay. You what you need to hear. Uh, that, uh, actually, I should pass that on to Armando, too. Yes, right. Well, I'll take care of that. Joan will come in here and tell us what else we need to know later on. I don't think it's her birthday. Chances are, I guess, statistically, uh, that it's not. But I'll ask just to make sure. Yeah. All right. And starting next month, I'll tell you all about how Medicare works. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, finally, Medicare for all, as far as you're concerned. Medicare for me. I mean, I don't know about yeah, everybody I don't, else. I don't, I don't, don't even see other people. I got mine. I stopped caring about the issue. <laughs> there you go. Which, That's one of the I'll symptoms that of turning side. 65. I'll, I'll be a gimitarian, just like you tell people. The right. Republicans are. Um, but uh, do you um, uh, have uh, all the supplies you need to keep people off your lawn? I don't know. Okay. Well, we'll work I, on that. I think, Electric I think you fencing, have to start with a lawn. Air horn. Oh, no lawn. No <laughs> That's wonder. That's the whole problem with that. Mm. The, theory i got okay one. all right well yeah uh, but you know i got a dog that's the whole point right? that will help and uh the, the, the dogs can leave things on the lawn that help keep people off it yeah they can leave things on other people's lawn too that's true what, that's right. what if that they're not for. 65 right, they care, gotta take I'll it talk to you tomorrow. all right very good enjoy your day see you later Ooh. and uh, i can't hold you up forever i'm gonna, I'm gonna keep you here till you're 70 and then i'll let you go all right thanks greg 
And uh, wow. And thanks, Bill, for the reminder as well. And uh, I hope it's not a surprise party that he's on his way to, I guess. Uh, it will have ruined that. I held off until he left. But if he's still listening, I'm hiding in your basement. But I was doing that anyway. I didn't even know it was your birthday. That's just the kind of person I am. Okay, moving on. I hope forever from that. Uh, we uh, have all sorts of <clears throat> all sorts of stories to pick out of uh, pocket and the tweet stream, and of course we're expecting Joan McCarter later on, unless it's her birthday and we didn't know about it. And uh, let's see. Well, where do we want to go first with this stuff? Um, you want to? We could do something fun and short, and just yell at the president and move on. Trump's golf costs. $102 million and counting, with taxpayers picking up the tab, reports uh, S.V. Dante over at HuffPost Politics. Trump, of course, uh, it says here in the subheader, promised never to golf. Do you remember when he did that? I won't be playing golf. I'm too busy. I'll be too busy running the country. But instead, of course, he spent more than twice as many days golfing as Obama at the same point, costing taxpayers over three times as much, which is amazing because he owns the golf courses that he plays at. So it's not the price of the golfing. It's how he goes and does it. And of course, the fact that he flies to Florida so frequently to do so or to New Jersey, as opposed to playing at the Army Navy course or something local, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how did he rack up $102 million? I don't know. Let's take a look. Um U.S. taxpayers have spent $81 million for the president's two dozen trips to Florida, according to a HuffPost analysis. By the way, you'll frequently hear him complaining about 91 uh, million. Was it, is it 91 million or is he, what does he say about uh, Puerto Rico's expenses? Is he saying the same, right? And 81 million on, uh, on expenses for golf. So I don't know. That doesn't sound like uh, such a great comparison. Quite honestly, although he's oh, it's ninety-one billion, that's the reason that it doesn't. That, that's like that's that's pretty odd. Could you be complaining about ninety-one million dollars? I mean, it's a lot of money to you and me, but surely he must be meaning ninety-one billion. Maybe a, so. Uh, only eighty-one million. It could go up. There's room for improvement. He could still spend eighty-one billion dollars on trips to Florida. Uh, let's see. They spent seventeen million for his fifteen trips to New Jersey. Another $1 million so he could visit his resort in Los Angeles. I don't even remember that one happening, but uh, so he did. And $3 million for his two days in Scotland last summer. $1.3 million of which went for just for rental cars for the massive entourage that accompanies a president abroad. So, interesting uh, way of, you know, controlling the deficit. Good job. Should we continue on with this? Probably not. That does remind me, though, I've noticed... Two stories in the last day or so about Trump and his vacation properties. I just thought it was kind of a weird thing. Uh, let's see. There was one in, was it the, in in the islands, down in the Caribbean islands somewhere. And then uh, the other, a mansion next door to or nearly next door to Mar-a-Lago that he owns. A, it used to belong to his sister, Marion uh, Trump. Was it right? What was her last name? Barry. And uh, anyway, she was a federal judge. Uh, we did cover the story of her recent retirement, right? Uh, she had to, uh, uh, she, or she she retired in uh, the um, in the wake of. And in opening of an investigation into her finances after the New York Times story broke about how the entire family had structured uh, Fred Trump's businesses and his uh, the wealth that he had bequeathed them in order to avoid taxation. And I mean, almost all taxation. And I guess they opened an ethics inquiry into her finances as a result of the story and the fact that she remained on the payroll as a federal judge. So she was semi-retired, really, at that point. She she went all the way retired because that has the effect of mooting the ethics investigation. So at any rate, she, uh, she went ahead and retired. And uh, afterward, at some point, 
I guess Trump bought her Florida house off her and I guess intended to buy it for the use of his kids. I don't know why they don't just stay at Mar-a-Lago, but I guess at this point, Mar-a-Lago is just such a circus. They don't want to stay there. So we're going to stay next door at uh, Aunt Marianne's uh, place. Uh, it's Marianne, I guess, not Marianne. But uh, at any rate, they uh, bought this. And I had read the other day that I think, what, he was uh, already carrying the most debt of any president in history and then went and borrowed 11 million more dollars in order to effect this purchase. And he borrowed $11 million to effect this purchase because he's so tremendously rich and is sitting on a giant pile of cash. As you know from the popular story about his being a successful billionaire businessman. So obviously you want to go and incur interest costs in order to buy your sister's house and give it to your kids. But at any rate, uh, the, the point of this bringing this story up was that the kids aren't going there. They're not staying there, at least at the moment. They don't appear to have any interest in being there for whatever reason. And so essentially he is airbnb this thing. It's listed on some sort of website. I don't even know if it's a Trump-branded website, but you can go online and rent various Trump vacation-type properties to stay at if you are rich, bored, dumb, a supporter of the president, wanting to launder emoluments in some way uh, and put money in his pocket. I don't know. Whatever your reasoning is. You know, and it's extraordinarily expensive, stupid expensive. It's not meant for people who are seriously looking for any kind of value whatsoever in their vacation. It's for it's for funneling money to, to Trump and nothing else. But, you know, $10,000 a night to rent out this or that mansion. But I just found that kind of interesting that as between these two properties and who knows how many more, uh, the rich successful guy he's so rich and so flush with cash that he owns all these vacation properties that he basically airb and b's in order to try and pick up a couple extra dollars here and there because of how rich and successful he is now of course his supporters would say that's why he's rich and successful he's always hustling for those extra dollars but that's not the picture we have of a billionaire in this country and it never will be so anyway uh, in the meantime, uh, he loves to play golf, which is supposed to be a rich man's game, but he never pays for that. And we all pay for that instead. And, uh, he's a hypocrite of the first order and should be, uh, chucked, uh, in the garbage bin of history as soon as possible. Okay. What else have we got, uh, to, to share with you? Let's see. Uh, it's, of course, it's going to be all, uh, largely related to impeachment. And I guess I might as well throw this one in here too. A lot of people passing around Greg Sargent's piece from yesterday a top democrat warns if we don't confront trump he'll grow more lawless it sounds familiar and it is familiar it's jamie raskin whose name we called the other day and who i guess i should point out if i didn't mention it the other day jamie i think i did right jamie raskin was outspoken at the time as a uh i think as a candidate still for state elective office. He was a vocal uh, supporter of looking into impeaching George W. Bush for his various infractions. So he's actually been sort of active and studying on the impeachment front for the, you know, with the idea in mind that you need to confront this kind of lawlessness where you meet it in order to prevent the same president from growing more lawless or future presidents from growing more lawless. And in the 2005, 2006 time frame, uh, Jamie Raskin was uh, right there alongside us in the, uh, in the blogosphere anyway. And occasionally in real life, I think with a couple the, the two of us appeared on one or two uh, panels or panels of speakers, one after the other in various settings but uh, still at it and still right on the subject. And yeah, if we don't confront Trump, he'll grow more lawless. The piece reads this way. House Democrats are embroiled in an increasingly intense debate over whether to launch an impeachment inquiry into Trump, uh, an outcome that appears to be growing harder for House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to resist. And indeed, today being Wednesday, there is a full caucus meeting on the schedule. We heard yesterday about the smaller gatherings that resulted in some confrontation 
yesterday, and uh, the dam appears to be breaking. The day was marked hour by hour, new Democratic members coming out with statements saying, yeah, I'm ready to, to say that it's time to talk about impeachment. That's, again, not jumping straight to we're going to vote on articles of impeachment or start the trial. It's just that we need to be talking about this and we need to be talking about it now. Uh, let's see. I think I saw this morning Don Beyer, uh, one of the suburban northern Virginia members of Congress and, uh, you know, generally a, a, a relatively quiet guy uh, and a relatively moderate guy uh, prior to elective office, uh, best known in northern Virginia as a Volvo salesman. So, you know, no screaming radical has a has a finger on the pulse of suburban soccer mom America, to say the least. Anyway, the Post reports, says Greg Sargent, that at a meeting on Monday night, well, we heard all about what happened to the meetings on Monday nights. Moments ago, former White House counsel Don McGahn uh, failed to honor Judiciary Committee subpoena, honoring Trump's command not to appear. Oh, and by the way, good comment yesterday from Michael Musson. Uh, I'll see if I can scroll back to dig it up, but he was pointing out how tortured the logic was that, uh, here it is, uh, it's also tortured logic from McGahn that he has to obey a presidential order not to testify about that time he disobeyed a presidential order. Now, of course, he'll fail to testify about anything, but yeah, remember Don McGahn uh, famously featured in uh, the articles about the many uh, Trump aides who simply ignored various of the president's demands and orders, hoping that he would forget about it and the whole thing would go away. So, yeah, that is a little bit weird. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, there were the meetings we discussed yesterday, Pelosi pushing back. Uh, tellingly, as this was happening, Trump was shouting to a rally crowd in Pennsylvania that the FBI and Democrats in general are guilty of, quote, treason. See, I told you he thought that. Vowing that Attorney General William Barr would investigate, that is, investigate his political opponents for invented crimes. The juxtaposition of these episodes neatly captures the dilemma. If Democrats fail to confront Trump's lawlessness, will it only continue to expand into the vacuum? And can I throw in just one more panic point in all this? Um, do, you know, don't let things run away with you, of course. You never want to let things get out of control. But remember that Trump's next planned outrage is pardoning various military war criminals. And we've discussed the weirdest possibilities of all this. But uh, if he starts pardoning at least one of the guys who's been profiled appears to come across in every possible way as a psycho spree killer wacko murderer and if you pardon that guy's murders and tell him and i did this for you wink wink and by the way all democrats are guilty of treason and so is everybody in the fbi and you know what we do with traitors in this country go to it don't worry about it i'll back you up with some pardons that's a dangerous place to be, and I don't know how you put that particular genie back in a bottle. Just saying. It's out there. Uh, one Democrat, writes Greg Sargent, involved in the Monday debate was Jamie Raskin. who's a constitutional law professor. They spoke. The transcript follows. Here's what it says. Where are you as of this morning? Jamie Raskin answering, I think that overwhelming evidence has been presented to us in the Mueller report and outside of it, too of high crimes and misdemeanors, and we should launch an impeachment inquiry. Remember, an inquiry doesn't prejudge the outcome. We're not talking about articles of impeachment. And that's not even the outcome. But anyway, it's a good point. As a member of the Judiciary and Oversight Committees, both, I do think the logic of an impeachment inquiry is pretty overwhelming at this point. Uh, Greg asks, is a majority of the caucus not on board yet? Hard to know, he answers, but this conversation is built into the committee system. Members of the Judiciary Committee are operating with detailed knowledge of the evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors spelled out in the Mueller report. We are intimately familiar with the president's aggressive obstruction of the congressional fact-finding functions. So, many of us have been led to the position that an impeachment inquiry is warranted. Question next, what's your response to the argument that an impeachment effort would hamstring other committees? Answer, as I told you yesterday, nothing in an impeachment inquiry would interfere in any way with other oversight investigations or other committees. It would just bring constitutional clarity to what some of the investigations are about. 
On the Oversight Committee, we're investigating corruption at the personnel office with respect to the granting of security clearances. If it turns out there's evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors there, there it is. It would be turned over to the Judiciary Committee. But it really doesn't have to be, by the way. Can I just say that again? But such policy oversight needs to go forward regardless because the handing out of security clearances to unqualified individuals is a grave matter. The purpose of investigations into matters covered by the special counsel report at this point should be to determine whether or not the president committed high crimes and misdemeanors. Mueller wrote of 11 different episodes of presidential obstruction. More than 900 former U.S. attorneys and federal prosecutors have said that anybody else in America would have been indicted and prosecuted for what the president did. So it's very hard for the Judiciary Committee to look at this overwhelming evidence and not say there should be an inquiry into whether there were high crimes and misdemeanors. Plumline then asking, what's the danger of not doing it? In politics, there are always risks of acting and risks of not acting. Why did the framers build the impeachment power into the Constitution? It's there as the people's last line of constitutional self-defense against a president who tramples the rule of law and acts like a king. If we don't respond constitutionally to the evidence advanced by the special counsel, we have de uh, dramatically lowered the standards for presidential conduct. Actually, he asks that as a question. Have we? Well, we have. I answered it for him. And lastly, I take it you reject the idea that the last line of defense for the American people is elections. And he answers, well, that's built into the system, and I am going to do everything in my power to make sure the elections restore democracy. But Mueller gave us pretty overwhelming evidence of the president's obstruction of justice. The evidence came galloping off the pages of the report and into the halls of Congress. He now refuses to cooperate with any committee of Congress. He's ordering his subordinates not to comply with subpoenas and not to appear as witnesses. It's wholly unprecedented and sweeping obstruction of congressional powers. And now, of course, time to check out the exercises of power they can use to countervail this. Welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Just a brief break there, and uh, now back to, I guess we'll conclude Greg Sargent's uh, interaction here with Jamie Raskin. There's a couple more good points to be made, and then on to a few more stories that we can set up before we hear from Joan. Let's see. Uh, we are mentioning, of course, that uh, Trump was engaged in, as Raskin said, a wholly unprecedented and sweeping obstruction of congressional powers. What we have with the administration is a theory of executive power that's essentially limitless and operates with impunity. Yes, I believe I've said that. The danger of constitutional inaction is that we invite ever more egregious departures from the rule of law and the Constitution. If the president can get away with trying to kill a criminal investigation that involves him, then he'll get the idea that he can go out and prosecute his real or imagined political enemies. And let's see, further questioning by not acting... With constitutional clarity, the House creates a vacuum for Trump to expand his lawlessness. That's not a question, but that's part of Greg's setup for it. We're seeing this both with Trump's blanket refusal of all oversight requests and with Trump telling his rally that the attorney general will investigate Democrats for treason. Even if the Senate were to acquit, it's still imperative that the House respond to those things and not allow that vacuum for lawlessness to be created. As some question, I don't. Know. That's it's really more of a statement than a question. But okay, I understand. Raskin replies, nonetheless. Who knows where it goes with him? What are the limits? It goes back to the question: What is the rule of law? The framers knew what kings could do and what kings would do. The rule of law is meant to constrain the behavior of those in power. Our caucus is unified around defending democracy and the rule of law. So, at a very minimum, basic level. That seems true. Uh, what to do about it is where they do not agree. But okay, an interesting conclusion, if only to hear Greg Sargent's non-question question at the end. He very much wanted to get that point across. And it's kind of a good thing, too, because it was a it was a good one. You could have just written it, but okay. So instead, you sneak it in as a non-question question for Jamie Raskin. Appropriate enough. All right, let's see. Other stories from yesterday. Much attention paid to this one. Uh, there is an angry dude uh, from I don't know where uh, who uh, tweets as heretical stoic, who's uh, or rather whose uh, Twitter handle is Judson 
Carmichael, I guess with a with a one and seven L at the end, and he's very upset because yesterday I typed a message about this story in all capital letters, and as you know, that must be responded to on Twitter. You can't just let people type in capital letters and not critique the substance of what they have to say as a result. And so, uh, poor uh, what's it? Judson has. Uh, Got it in his head that it's now his single-minded responsibility to uh, to lecture uh, those of us who were foolish enough to believe that yesterday's IRS memo uh, actually undermines the Treasury's excuse for not turning over Donald Trump's uh, tax returns. Now, it does. But because I typed it in all caps, he's very excited to share with me Marty Lederman's latest piece in which he makes a technical argument for uh, the fact that uh, the IRS memo, I guess, doesn't say exactly what people thought it said. So maybe we can find out about those things. The first, though, the story of the memo itself. The Washington Post uh, had this story. Did anybody else have anything that we needed to look at? Mm, on that question no okay we can jump into that one confidential draft irs memo says tax returns must be given to congress unless president invokes executive privilege that was, headline was immediately sort of suspicious because people said what uh executive privilege that that wouldn't appear to apply in this case of course most of his tax returns are from before he was the executive so privileging them under that theory would be difficult to do. And then, of course, uh, there's nothing about your tax returns that would reflect the deliberative process for the executive branch. So it would appear to be a pretty weak claim. I don't know if that's what Lederman's talking about, but I don't think so. Anyway, Jeff Stein and Josh Dawsey put this story out, and it made the rounds yesterday made a big splash. A confidential IRS legal memo says tax returns must be given to Congress unless the president takes the rare step of asserting executive privilege, according to a copy of the memo obtained by the Washington Post. The memo contradicts the Trump administration's justification for denying lawmakers' request for President Trump's tax returns, exposing fissures in the executive branch. But I guess Marty Lederman doesn't think so. Trump has refused to turn over his tax returns but has not invoked executive privilege. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin has instead denied the returns by arguing there is no legislative purpose for demanding them. We discussed that at length yesterday. Uh wasn't directly addressed in uh, Judge Mehta's uh, decision in the uh, very separate case of the subpoena to the uh, accounting firm, but the logic is the same. Uh, the idea of requiring a legislative purpose for subpoenas, for materials subpoenaed, is very, very weak in Judge Mehta's eyes, and I'm sure that he would see it as even weaker in the case, I would guess, of the tax returns, given that there's a specific statutory authorization for the request, and no mention is made of legislative purpose there. But According to the IRS memo, which has not been previously reported, the disclosure of tax returns to the committee, quote, is mandatory, requiring the secretary to disclose returns and return information requested by the tax writing chairs. The 10 page document says the law does not allow the secretary to exercise discretion in disclosing the information, provided the statutory conditions are met and directly rejects the reason Mnuchin has cited for withholding the information. The secretary's obligation to disclose return and return information would not be affected by the failure of a tax writing committee to state a reason for the request, it says. There's an ellipsis in there, by the way. We should investigate it. It adds that the only basis the agency's refusal to comply with the committee's subpoena would be the invocation of the doctrine of executive privilege. The memo is the first sign of political dissent within the administration over its approach to the tax returns issue. The IRS said the memo titled Congressional Access to Returns and Return Information, was a draft document written by a lawyer in the office of chief counsel and did not represent the agency's, quote, official position. The memo is stamped draft. It's not signed and it does not reference Trump, nor really would it. 
But okay. The agency says the memo was prepared in the fall. At the time, Democrats were making clear they probably would seek copies of Trump's tax returns under that 1924 law that, well, says you can. Precisely who wrote the memo and reviewed it could not be learned. The agency says IRS Commissioner Charles Reddick and current Chief Counsel Michael Desmond, who was confirmed by the Senate in February, were not familiar with it until a post-inquiry this week. The IRS says it was never forwarded to Treasury. Executive privilege is generally defined as the president's ability to deny requests for information about internal administration talks and deliberations. On Friday, Mnuchin rejected a subpoena from the Ways and Means Committee to turn over the records, uh, a move that probably will now lead to a court battle. Mnuchin has criticized the demands as harassment that could be directed against any political enemy, arguing Congress lacks a legitimate legislative purpose in seeking the documents. Breaking with precedent, of course, you know, Trump didn't uh, reveal his tax returns, uh, saying without evidence that he's under audit, which he's probably not. Mnuchin and other senior staff members never reviewed the IRS memo, according to a Treasury spokesman. But the spokesman said it did not undermine the department's argument that handling over the president's tax returns would run afoul of the Constitution's mandate that information given to Congress must pertain to legislative issues. Interesting. The spokesman said the secretary is following a legal analysis from the Justice Department that he, quote, may not produce the requested private tax return information. May not. Interesting. Uh, Both agencies have denied requests for copies of the Justice Department's advice to Treasury. Some legal experts said the memo provides further evidence that the Trump administration is using shaky legal foundations to withhold the tax returns. The memo is clear in its interpretation of the law that the IRS shall furnish the information, said William Lawrence. It looks like Lawrence, but spelled with an O, who served for about two decades as an attorney in the IRS chief counsel's office and reviewed the memo at the request of the Post. Daniel Hemmel, or perhaps email, the uh, professor at the University of Chicago Law School. I think we've used his name before and made the same comment on pronunciation. Well, he also reviewed the memo said the document suggests a split over Trump's returns between career staffers and political appointees at IRS and the Treasury Department. Probably true. The memo writer's interpretation is that IRS has no wiggle room on this. Mnuchin is saying the House Ways and Means Committee has not asserted a legislative, a legitimate legislative purpose. The memo says they don't have to assert a legislative purpose or any purpose at all. I say so, too. The administration has resisted a range of House inquiries, as you know, although a federal judge on Monday ruled the president's accounting firm must turn over his financial records to Congress. Treasury said there's been an extensive discussion over the tax return issue. One official said the issue put the agency in a difficult spot because Trump has predetermined the outcome and because Mnuchin is a Trump ally who was the finance chair of his campaign. That decision has been made, this official said, who spoke on condition of anonymity. It is up to us to try to justify it. Trump has told advisors he will battle the issue to the Supreme Court, according to people familiar with the matter. Trump recently argued that his tax returns were an issue for in the 2016 election, but that because he won, they should no longer be of concern. Remember that one? Last week, Mnuchin told the Senate panel that Treasury lawyers held a early discussion about disclosing the returns long before Democrats officially demanded the documents in April. He didn't reveal the details of that deliberation or say what, if any, legal memos he had reviewed. Some legal experts have held that the law is clear in giving Congress the power to compel the provision of returns. Other former government lawyers, including two who served in the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations, have argued that the law is unconstitutional and could lead to widespread abuses of taxpayer privacy or for political aims. Uh, and I would bet that's probably what Lederman is on about because uh, others have made the objection too. I mean, there is some concern about that. And a 1924 law, probably at the time that it was passed, probably didn't give a great examination of the constitutional questions in the context of the abuse of power and uh, Congress being able to uh, request the tax returns of just about anybody. But of course, uh, nothing in the law authorizes members of the House to release any of the information to the general public that are contained therein, just simply that they can review the tax returns. It does pose some significant privacy issues, but those are already punishable by law for, uh, you know, in the case of any uh, unauthorized disclosures. 
But Congress gets confidential and classified information all the time for their decision-making process. So let's see. Can we jump from here at this point uh, over to Marty Lederman's thing? Let's take a quick look at his thread here. I agree, he says, with Oren. Uh, and uh, Oren Kerr is who he's talking about here. Oren saying... Breaking news, unknown governmental lawyer wrote a legal memo. Seriously, this should not be treated as a major news story. Eh, at this stage, you certainly can. Uh, not only is it a draft memo by a subordinate lawyer, says Marty Lederman, but more importantly, it simply doesn't engage with the constitutional argument on which Treasury now relies. And that's because, of course, it was an IRS memo, not a Treasury memo. Uh, DOT, Treasury, that is, not transportation, now assumes that ways and means manifestly lacks any legitimate basis for seeking the returns. That assumption is wrong. The returns are obviously relevant to the question, for instance, of whether Trump has obligations to Russian and other foreign interests. But the draft memo doesn't rebut that assumption because it was written earlier, nor does it address whether Treasury would be right that it would have to turn over the returns if it were correct in about a manifest absence of any legitimate purpose. <clears throat> I'm not even certain where he's going with this one here. Let's see. The draft memo doesn't reset, rebut that assumption. It doesn't address whether Treasury would be right that it wouldn't have to turn over the returns if it were correct about a manifest absence of any legitimate purpose. Okay. Make no mistake, I think Treasury's view is based upon a mistaken premise, although I also think Congress, the uh, House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence in particular, could do a much better job justifying the request, though they did not make the request. It was ways and means. So large error there for Marty. Uh, but this memo, understandably, does not even engage on the relevant constitutional question. It is instead entirely focused on the statutory analysis, substantially all of which DOT now accepts, if I'm not mistaken. So let's see, that was offered up. Uh, did he have a write up about this? He was just, uh, let's see, it was offered up by the guy who was angry about my capital letters. By the way, the capital capitalized message from yesterday, in case you were curious about what that was, was just me saying, basically, the story here is, and I, I used all caps. I mean, I know you're not supposed to use all caps for things and people find it annoying, but there was an awful lot of discussion of the subject going on. And I, I basically used it as a visual tool to help break through the clutter more than anything else. The story here is that everyone who read the law about Trump's taxes immediately had it right. But the White House... IRS and Treasury lied to you for two weeks and everybody spent that time unsure of themselves and their grip on reality. In other words, gaslighting. And then a lot of people spent a lot of time sending me uh, definitions of gaslighting. I, I know that's what I'm talking about. Even if you were knew you were right right away, the plan here was to freeze the ob so-called objective press in place and burn as much clock as possible. And you and your country have suffered for it. That was the point of my talking about that. I wanted to analyze the story from a slightly different angle, and I thought it was important. And sometimes when you put things in all caps, it cuts through clutter and catches the eye of people who might otherwise let it slide by uh, among the rest of the, the comments flying by at any given moment on Twitter. And uh, let me just say this. It worked because I don't know who heretical stoic Judson Carmichael is, I don't follow him. He doesn't follow me. I am not sure if any of you know him or not. But uh, I know he was making a harmless enough joke, uh, the, although his his uh, his response was, uh, Grandpa, we can hear you just fine in lowercase too, which is, ha ha, I know, I get it. It's a very fun stock response to people who type things in all caps. But the idea was, as a visual tool to cut through the clutter and grab a few eyeballs that don't ordinarily pay attention to this particular feed when it gets passed on. And guess what? It worked, and it bothered Judson Carmichael so much that now he's reading Marty Lederman on the subject, and oh well, I guess that's a win for me. But he was very upset that I used capital letters, and uh, it's great for all of us that a day later we're still talking about what case 
I typed this point in. Anyway, so he offered this up this morning, as I see, and directing it to me. This is an example of why we should think three times before shouting on the internet. And he sends me Marty Lederman's piece, which basically says that, yeah, you were right on the law. Uh, there are constitutional issues here, but of course, this memo addresses the statutory uh, uh, interpretation. And yeah, that's what I was talking about, the law. Everyone who, and my other point about this whole thing was, uh, I guess the previous comment or two that I had made on the memo was that this is basically, look, anyone with a pencil could have written this memo and gotten it right. But instead, here we are, weeks later, with an administration concocting idiotic legal theories about it and insisting that it's all so complicated. But yeah, uh, what were they after? They got it. They had a two-week head start in making everybody out there think that there was legitimate, that there was such a thing as legitimate legislative interest in this question because the White House sent out men in suits to say that there was such a thing. And now, mysteriously, everyone believes that there is such a thing, and everybody is looking around to see whether a legitimate legislative interest has been expressed. And then Judge Mehta came out and said, no, uh, that's not actually necessary. And even if it was, the courts wouldn't do anything to look at how legitimate it was. I mean, there are places where you can, I suppose, there's places that I don't know about where you could be demanding some demonstration of legitimate legislative interest in order to justify the request that you're making. And I think the answer to that is that in 99% of cases, if the legislature says we have an interest, that's all the inquiry the court will be interested in. And the inquiry from that point is, is over. You move on to the rest of the subject. As with everything, when you're dealing with a question of the president of the United States, uh, you know, it's uh, it will a everything will take longer and b you have to examine the constitutional implications of everything. Ah, note here from Joan. Oh, she won't be able to make it today. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. she's dealing with a you know a plumbing emergency, and those are always the worst kind. I don't think we're disclosing too much information there. We're not telling you the the GPS location of the plumbing here, but it's not a surprise birthday party, which would have been a lot better. Sorry, Joan. Thanks for the note, though. But this gives us, I guess, some leeway to go on exploring these things, even if it's not as much fun as it would be uh, otherwise to having Joan around. OK, well, we'll miss you, Joan, and uh, we'll carry on. Now, does Le I, I looked at this. Did Lederman have anything in terms of uh, pre uh, any uh, written product here? Let's see. Well, maybe we can look at Oren Kerr and his take on things. Confidential draft, IRS memo, right? All that whole thing. Uh, oh, guess he's just referring to it. And he's just basically dismissing it because who cares about some draft memo from a nameless lawyer? Hmm, that's one approach to things. Uh, Lederman, I guess, includes just a PDF of the memo, which is lengthy enough that we can't bother reading it on the air. But I guess just generally speaking... Yeah, I mean, I don't really understand why uh, this was supposed to be of such tremendous interest. Eh, let's see. I don't know. So there's not too much developing in, in that thread. But yeah, I'm just trying to give it some thought here for a second. An example of why we should think three times before shouting on the Internet. Hmm. Yeah, Lederman doesn't... I don't know. I I, I, I don't see really anything that seems to discredit the idea here. I mean, re-upping from last night. He goes, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, DOT's view on Trump's tax records, which is wrong, but not because of anything in that memo. In other words, I guess what he's saying is Treasury is wrong, but not based on the memo because the memo addresses the statutory issue on which I'm right. But in addition, Treasury is stating something different and wrong and on which I am also right, even though that wasn't the discussion yesterday in all caps. Uh, it was the discussion yesterday on the show, why the Treasury Department uh, doesn't have a 
valid legal argument for withholding this information on constitutional grounds either. But we're going to have to waste some time, I guess, uh, having judges come to the conclusion that we were right and that lay people reading the law were perfectly capable last time. And now for any remaining questions on the constitutional issues, we'll let the lawyers hash it out, uh, even though it appears that the lawyers for the administration are wrong about this as well. And we'll give over two weeks to pleadings and a ruling saying so at some point later on. Okay. Well, I'm glad we settled that issue. Uh, will I go back and try and settle that on Twitter? Probably not. Not really that interesting a subject, although maybe it warrants a quick response. Although, Or it may warrant muting <laughs> Jordan Carmichael, I think, as a distraction. But anyway, I'm glad at least we got the uh, uh, viewpoints of Marty Lederman on the record. I will have to search his timeline to see whether I can make any more sense of why he was so insistent on re-upping the notice to the rest of us that the IRS was right on the, 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 the IRS draft memo, correct on the law, the upper echelons of the IRS incorrect on the law, and that Treasury wrong on the constitutional matters. Hmm. It doesn't seem like something that he really needs to tear his hair out about, if you ask me. Okay. Uh, other stories that uh, we ought to share. This is an interesting one here, too. Uh, Rex Tillerson, apparently meeting with House Foreign Affairs Committee yesterday to talk about Trump. There was a story in the Washington Post on it and one from the Daily Beast. And I don't know who broke the story first, although now I'm thinking, uh, did I see the Daily Beast claiming to have gotten the story first or were they pointing to yes first reported by the daily beast so okay we'll honor that and read their piece about it rex tillerson secretly meets with house foreign affairs committee to talk trump the former secretary of state talked with lawmakers about his time with the president and the frictions he had with the president's son-in-law uh aaron banco writing this piece and uh, we'll note at the outset no objection apparently although maybe that was partially because of the secret part no objection from the White House to the former Secretary of State testifying, I guess. Maybe it was an, was it an informal discussion or was it formal testimony? Um, eh, let's see. On, uh, on, on uh, his testimony to the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm distracted by Josh Marshall's piece here, which we might want to turn to later on. Even most frustrated Democrats don't plan to defy Pelosi on impeachment. We'll see exactly what that means, perhaps later on, if we have the time to do it. Uh, I don't know whether we will, and I'm not certain whether beyond the headline it means anything more. Then, okay, well, we won't defy her. We're just going to make her change her mind and then go along with her. That that's what that could mean. But back to Rex Tillerson, who apparently was not blocked from testifying, uh, even though Don McGahn was, and both are ex-employees. Former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson spoke with the leaders of the House Foreign Affairs Committee on Tuesday in a lengthy session that an aide said touched on his time working in the Trump administration, the frictions he had with the president's son-in-law, and efforts to tackle issues like Russian interference in the election. Tillerson's appearance, first reported by the Daily Beast, took place as virtually every other Trump world luminary had just been stonewalling congressional oversight efforts. At the same time, the former Secretary of State was speaking before lawmakers. Former White House counsel Don McGahn was ignoring a subpoena to testify in front of the House Judiciary Committee. Tillerson's arrival at the Capitol was handled with extreme secrecy. No media advisories or press releases were sent out announcing his appearance, and he took a little-noticed route into the building in order to avoid being seen by members of the media. Tillerson reached out to the committee and expressed a willingness to meet, a committee aide said. In a more than six-hour meeting, he told members and staffers that the Trump administration actively avoided confronting Russia about allegations of interference in the election in an effort to develop a solid relationship with the Kremlin, a committee aide told the Daily Beast. Huh? Pretty much just as expected on that front. Tillerson also told members and aides that he tried to establish a formal and disciplined interagency process at the State Department, whereby the president could receive informed briefings. That might be a good idea. 
on sensitive foreign policy matters, the aide said. Now, normally the process by which the president can receive informed briefings is we just give them briefings. What he's basically saying, I think, here in so many words is we had to find new ways to present this information to him because he's a moron. Anyway, that effort never manifested, Tillerson told the committee, in part because of the president's management style, but also because of interference from other aides. Let's say that when we come back from our two-minute break, we'll find out which aides those were after this. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning, with a brand new, brand new interruption to say thanks to all of you who support the show. Remember when I told you that our average monthly donation was about $7, for which you were getting two great hours of news and entertainment five days a week, and how that came out to about 70 cents an hour? That's a pretty good deal, except it's wrong. The math actually works out closer to 17 cents an hour. It is hard to beat a deal like that, and even harder to send your kids to college on. Thankfully, Patreon.com makes it easy to make that work. Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is the simple, secure way to make recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Just search for me or the show name on the site, And they make it easy to crowdfund the show so that the power of our numbers can keep the show going for just a few bucks a month. Once again, thanks so much for all your support. Welcome back now to the Kango in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's uh, jump back into the Daily Beast reporting about Rex Tillerson's surprise, I guess, and secret otherwise. Meeting with the House Foreign Affairs Committee members, still not clear uh, in what context they were meeting, and I don't know if the article will clear it up any, but uh, uh, certainly of some interest. So who were the aides who got in the way of his attempt to establish, as he says, a formal and disciplined interagency process at the State Department whereby the president could receive informed briefings on sensitive foreign policy matters? In other words, how can they dumb down regular briefings so that this president could come to understand them? It doesn't matter because they never got to it because Jared Kushner got in the way. That's the guy we're talking about. Jared Kushner at times impeded his ability to communicate effectively and introduce to the president policy proposals developed by State Department experts on major foreign affairs matters across the globe, not just in the Middle East. Kushner, a White House advisor, has publicly focused much of his international efforts on the Middle East and is set to unveil a Middle East peace plan in the coming weeks. And uh, I think we can probably say right now it's going to suck. And that's a guess, but I bet we'll be right. Tillerson had a notoriously prickly relationship with the president, reportedly calling him a moron in private. Uh, Unlike me, I do it in public. But, well, it's virtually in private compared to the platform he's got. But anyway, uh, he was present during critical moments of the administration, including Trump's private 2017 meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Hamburg, Germany. Hmm, Hamburg, as he calls it. Uh, Since leaving his post, Tillerson has rarely made public appearances, save for speaking at a panel in Houston in December. During that appearance, he said there was, quote, no question Russia interfered in the 2016 presidential election. So often, the president would say, here's what I want to do and here's how I want to do it. And I would have to say to him, Mr. President, I understand what you want to do, but you can't do it that way. It violates the law, Tillerson said. Tillerson's interview by House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Elliot Engel, interview, see, interesting, and ranking member Michael McCall, Republican of Texas, comes a month after special counsel Robert Mueller published his report. Uh, Since then, top Dems on the Hill have demanded that Bill Barr and Mueller answer questions related to the report and its publication. Barr declined to testify. Um, Mueller reportedly in negotiations to testify. That is another big story of the day. Apparently, he's worried about appearing political. Yikes, not that. And so I guess the big holdup in getting him to testify is he's not sure he wants to do it, or maybe he wants to be made to do it. I don't know. But uh, Nadler, of course, has put it out there that he will testify one way or the other, period. So hmm. uh, now he's got to enter into negotiations over whether or not he's going to hold him to that or hold himself to his own demand. 
Mueller, uh, in negotiations, though the Department of Justice has previously not agreed on a date for him to testify. On Tuesday, CNN reported that Mueller's team had expressed reluctance about the possibility of a testimony taking place in public for fear it would appear political. Just as we said and included here is the uh, Manu Raju tweet to that effect. And I guess that's it. That wraps up the uh, piece from the Daily Beast. I don't know that we'll glean a whole lot more from the Washington Post story on it. What's their title? Uh, They were mostly going on about in the headline about how long it took for him to to talk with them. But I guess it wasn't a hearing per se, because then it would have been open to the public and everyone would have seen it. And there'd be a transcript. And uh, I don't know if they do. I mean, I guess they do have a provision for closed hearings at the Foreign Affairs Committee. But at any rate, what else have we got here? Uh, a number of other things. Oh, how about this one? So we can fill some time with this. Uh, everyone loves comparing Trump to Hitler, right? There's no more Godwin's law. Godwin repealed Godwin's law. Uh, interesting piece here from Tom Phillips in Newsweek, of all places. I don't know why I say that. I just, I just am. Tom Phillips, uh, of course, uh, identifies as a Journalist and writer based in London and the editorial director of BuzzFeed UK, now editor at Full Fact, the UK's independent fact-checking charity. It's a charity. How do you like that? Uh, I I give you his identity because he's very tongue-in-cheek and humorous in his approach to things, and it might lead you to question exactly who is this guy. It's clearly not a straight-up news report. And it is labeled as an opinion piece. But check out the headline here. Hitler was incompetent and lazy, and his Nazi government was an absolute clown show. Opinion, it says here. And uh, I don't know if I I wasn't around to agree. And uh, of course, uh, well, he addresses it right up top here. Is He says, uh, look, I know what you're thinking. Putting Hitler in a book about the terrible mistakes we've made as a species isn't exactly the boldest move ever. Oh, wow, never heard of him. What a fascinating historical nugget. It's something you're probably not saying right now. But beyond him being obviously a genocidal maniac, there's an aspect to Hitler's rule that kind of gets missed in our standard view of him, even in popular culture. Uh, If popular culture has long enjoyed turning him into an object of mockery, we still tend to believe that the Nazi machine was ruthlessly efficient and that the great dictator spent most of his time, well, dictating things and you know the the old saw is you know the trains ran on time or whatever it was even though that was i think about italy but okay uh the idea that they were ruthlessly efficient and that uh you know they they were at at least over they were organized like uh, hillary clinton was over prepared hitler was at least organized okay but apparently not or at least uh according to this story i don't know it's not really something that they examine a great deal of in the uh, American history books. Probably not in German history books either. So it goes on to say it's worth remembering that Hitler was actually an incompetent, lazy egomaniac and his government was an absolute clown show. And I could probably just finish there and say, we get the point. If we were to believe you, I think I know what you mean by bringing up a lazy, incompetent egomaniac with a government who's, which is a clown show. You're talking about Trump. I get it. Uh, Let's see if there's more to it. In fact, this may even have helped his rise to power as he was consistently underestimated by the German elite. This point has been made before. Before he became chancellor, many of his opponents had dismissed him as a joke for his crude speeches and tacky rallies. Even after elections had made the Nazis the largest party in the Reichstag, people still kept thinking that Hitler was an easy mark, a blustering idiot who could be easily controlled by smart people. Hmm, where have I heard this before? Why did the elites of Germany so consistently under mis- underestimate Hitler or misunderestimate Hitler, as uh, George W. Bush would have said? Possibly because they weren't actually wrong in their assessment of his competency. They just failed to realize that this wasn't enough to stand in the way of his ambition. As it would turn out, Hitler was really bad at running a government. As his own press chief, Otto Dietrich, later wrote in his memoir, The Hitler I Knew, funny but okay Uh, in the 12 years of his rule in germany hitler produced the biggest confusion in government that has ever existed in a civilized state welcome to the united states he's you know long gone but okay we could have invited him here by the way 
uh, again, to give you some context of the approach that Tom Phillips is taking here, this is an excerpt from his book entitled Humans, A Brief History of How We Effed It All Up. <laughs> so that's what we're looking at here. Uh, so uh, continuing on, his government, Hitler's, was constantly in chaos with officials having no idea what he wanted them to do and nobody was entirely clear who was actually in charge of what. He procrastinated wildly when asked to make difficult decisions. Two weeks, two weeks, or uh, zwei weeks, I guess. Is that right? Zwei? Anyway, uh, and would often end up relying on gut feeling. Who else says that? Leaving even close allies in the dark about his plans. If there was a Twitter man... He would have done it. Anyway, uh, uh, encryption was much better then with the old Enigma thing. Or at least our our encryption cracking was uh, less reliable than we have now. His unreliability had those who worked with him pulling out their hair as his confidant Ernst, who? Ernst Hanfstengel. Did I get anywhere near that one? Later wrote in his memoir... It's in German. Zweischen Weissem und Braunem Haus. What? All right. I don't know why we even tried that one. This meant that rather than carrying out the duties of state, they spent most of their time infighting and backstabbing each other in an attempt to either win his approval or avoid his attention altogether, depending on what mood he was in that day. This does sound familiar. And, of course, it's meant to and be scary, right? There's a bit of an argument among historians about whether this was a deliberate ploy on Hitler's part to get his own way or whether he was just really, really bad at being in charge of stuff. Not the same problem now. Dietrich, uh, is he, uh, ca- he loves, I thrive on chaos or you just are bad at things. Dietrich himself came down on the side of it being a cunning tactic to sow division and chaos. <gasps> Can't believe chaos was just invoked there. Greg, are you listening? Happy birthday. It's undeniable, that's our present to you, chaos gets introduced here. It's undeniable that he was very effective at all that, but when you look at Hitler's personal habits, it's hard to shake the feeling that he was just a natural result of pushing a work-shy narcissist, putting a work-shy narcissist in charge of a country. Pretty much. Hitler was incredibly lazy. According to his aide, Fritz Wiedemann, uh, even when he was in Berlin, He wouldn't get out of bed until after 11 a.m. and wouldn't do much before lunch other than read what the newspapers had to say about him, press cuttings being dutifully delivered to him by Dietrich. He was obsessed with the media and celebrity and often seems to have viewed himself through that lens. He once described himself as the greatest actor in Europe and wrote to a friend, I believe my life is the greatest novel in world history. In many of his personal habits, he came across as strange or even childish. He would have regular naps during the day. He would bite his fingernails at the dinner table, and he had a remarkably sweet tooth that led him to eat prodigious amounts of cake and put so many lumps of sugar in his cup that there was hardly any room for the tea. He was deeply insecure about his own lack of knowledge, preferring to either ignore information that contradicted his preconceptions or to lash out at the expertise of others. He hated being laughed at, but enjoyed it when other people were the butt of the joke. He would perform mocking impressions of people he disliked. Hmm. But he also craved the approval of those he disdained, and his mood would quickly improve if a newspaper wrote something complimentary about him. All of this is very convincing, except uh, I do have to note somewhere along the line that I don't know whether any of this is true. And, you know, if it is, then I guess they hit the nail on the head. And if not, then okay. Uh, I guess that's really it. Hmm. Uh, okay. So maybe it's a story. I guess not. Uh, I I can't, I couldn't tell you. Anyway, we'll finish up here. Little of this was especially secret or unknown at the time. I don't know about it, but it wasn't live at the time. That's, that's exactly the issue. It's why so many people failed to take Hitler seriously until it was too late, dismissing him as merely a half mad rascal or a man with a beery vocal organ. I don't even know what that's supposed Okay. In a sense, they weren't wrong. In another, much more important sense, they were as wrong as it's possible to get. Hitler's personal failings didn't stop him having an uncanny instinct for political rhetoric that would gain mass appeal, and it turns out you don't actually need to have a particularly competent or functional government to do terrible things. 
We tend to assume that when something awful happens, there must have been some great controlling intelligence behind it. It's understandable. How could things have gone so wrong, we think, if there wasn't an evil genius pulling the strings? The downside of this is that we tend to assume that if we can't immediately spot an evil genius, then we can all chill out because everything will be fine. But history suggests that's a mistake, and it's one we make over and over again. Many of the worst man-made events that ever occurred were not the product of evil geniuses. Instead, they were the product of a parade of idiots and lunatics incoherently flailing their way through events, helped along the way by overconfident people who thought they could control them. So, interesting. And uh, like I said, uh, if true, and I, I have no reason to doubt it, quite honestly, uh, a scary parallel, but one that's been illustrated in so many other ways that... Uh, I don't know whether this really changes any minds about it, but it's certainly very interesting and uh, a good reminder that, uh, yeah, it, it, a good thing to keep in mind in the ongoing debate that we have over whether he's, uh, you know, an evil, cunning genius or a bumbling idiot, and it doesn't really matter which one he is so long as he holds the reins of government, I guess, even if he's only got the slightest grip on them. Ah, let's see. Other various uh, topics of interest to share with you. There's something else, I guess, off the beaten path uh, of, of our usual uh, impeachment talk. But just to bring you back to, uh, harken back to the good old days, uh, WNYC Public Radio has an interesting story here. Bridgegate, remember that? Bridgegate defendant Bridget Kelly says voicemails prove she was fall person. She's not talking about her color wheel. She means... The fall guy, but she's not a guy, you see, for Chris Christie on Bridgegate. And I guess this story changed as the morning went on. She was due in court and I guess preparing to report for a 13-month sentence. Let's read on here. Matt Katz reporting here for WNYC. The saga of the lane closure scandal known as Bridgegate is almost over. As the last person convicted for the scheme... Former Governor Chris Christie's aide, Bridget Kelly, prepares to report for a 13-month stint at a West Virginia prison on July 10th. But before she begins her sentence, and I guess she was due to go in earlier, but won an extension to July 10th, I think this morning in court. Before she begins her sentence, she provided WNYC with a voicemail from a sitting New Jersey Supreme Court justice that says she indicates she was the fall person for the whole affair. The tweet that tipped me off to it, and I think it was from Matt Katz, basically summing the whole thing up, that uh, when she was starting out her case and looking for a defense attorney, she was approached by someone sent her way, a prominent New Jersey attorney apparently, who uh, took up her case, listened to her tell all that she knew about the story in preparation for her defense, and who then promptly quit her defense instead. In other words, came in, heard all the dish, and got a clear sense of what Bridget Kelly had on Christie that might put Christie in danger, but then quit the case, didn't represent her, and was then almost immediately thereafter nominated to the New Jersey State Supreme Court by Chris Christie. That is a very suspicious looking picture of what happened here. I don't know if it's an accurate picture, but it was suspicious enough sounding that it made it, it was very juicy and interesting. And I wanted to share it with you. Let's see what the reporting actually says here. Uh, before she begins the sentence, she provided WNYC with this voicemail that she says indicates she was a fall person for the whole affair. That's a very awkward phrase, fall person, but I guess we have to do that on January 8th. 2014, Kelly's infamous email to the Port Authority, time for some traffic problems in Fort Lee, signaled that the mayor of Fort Lee would be punished with lane closures at the George Washington Bridge, creating traffic jams in the town, which sits on the Jersey side of the George Washington Bridge. Uh, brief aside here, just to say that uh, you knew this, but just to remind everybody that Chris Christie was every bit the infantile vituperative jackass that Donald Trump was, although Trump was a lot dumber and harder to convince 
that there was a line that he couldn't cross legally. But everything that Chris Christie thought he could get away with, he would try up to and including creating traffic nightmares in the town of mayors who don't give him what he wants politically. All right. So the email put Kelly at the center of a legal and media firestorm. Hours after its release, she got this voicemail and it reads, Hey, Bridget, it's Wally Timpone. Timpone? I don't know how he produces, pronounces that. T-I-M-P-O-N-E. Timpony. Like, not the drum, right? But Wally Timpone. Timpone. Hmm. No time to look up his pronunciation. We might not get it either. I'm a lawyer at McElroy, Mulvaney, Deutsch, and Carpenter, the place where, it says bracketed here, Christy Confident, Michelle Brown worked for a while. And I'm a former federal prosecutor at the U.S. Attorney's Office. I understand that you may be in need of representation and that you may be served a subpoena. I am happy to help. Uh, funny, like his resume is pretty good, but it actually had a big blinking warning light. And I'm a former pr federal prosecutor at the U.S. Attorney's Office, which means he would have probably been working for Chris Christie when he was U.S. Attorney, which, you know, is supposed to give him credibility with Bridget Kelly, who's uh, obviously, uh, I guess up until right this moment, um, a big Chris Christie fan and clearly a Republican operative. Here comes another Republican operative lawyer to help her out. So, she takes the bait. Kelly, who at the time was driven out of her house by the storm of reporters who flooded her block, said she called Tim Pony back and he said that people were worried about me. They wanted to make sure I was taken care of, Kelly said. A single mother of four, Kelly said she was even promised a soft landing, a new job with benefits. But there was a problem, Kelly soon realized. She was already under investigation by a special committee of the state legislature. And Timponi was a Christie appointee to the Election Law Enforcement Commission, which is in charge of regulating legislators' campaign donations. Wouldn't this be a conflict of interest? I said, well, how can you represent me? Kelly asked. He said, I can. Don't worry. It's not a big deal. Okay. So they met twice. Kelly told Timponi about his law partners and his law partners what she knew, including the fact that that she had told Christie about the lane closures, which she still says she believed to be a part of a traffic study. A, a dumb study, right? It's going to cause traffic problems. Good study. A, few, a federal jury later agreed with federal prosecutors that this was a political retaliation scheme aimed at the mayor of Fort Lee, who had not endorsed Christie's reelection. The callous tone of Kelly's emails were the key pieces of evidence against her. Kelly said she now believes Timponi was sent to her, quote, on a mission by Christie allies so they could download what she knew, including anything incriminating on Christie. Because a few days after that first meeting, Timponi called Kelly and quit, citing his role on the Election Law Enforcement Commission. <laughs> okay. They just discussed that. Timponi, through a spokesperson, declined comment, but he has said it was an oversight to represent Kelly, given the obvious conflict. Christie's spokeswoman did not return an email for comment. Hmm, some oversight. Now, she may not have actually said what she says she said to him, but who knows. Uh, but uh, if she did, no oversight at all. Kelly pointed to one other fact to make her argument that Tim Pony was working as an emissary to control the fallout for the governor and not as an attorney to protect her. Christie's own internal investigation of the Bridgegate affair revealed that Timponi's name was first floated as a potential lawyer for Kelly during a meeting with Christie and his top advisors at the governor's mansion on January 8th, the same day that Timponi left Kelly the voicemail. Kevin O'Dowd, Kelly's former boss and Christie's chief of staff, told investigators that it was suggested during this meeting that Timponi represent Kelly. In the same conversation, O'Dowd said it was decided that Kelly would be fired. They're saying they need to get Bridget Kelly an attorney, Kelly said. Why are they worried about Bridget Kelly if they decide Bridget Kelly has to be fired? I like when she uses third person. It's great. They were ready to show me the door, and then they took care of me? During this initial voicemail, Timponi name-dropped his former colleague, Michelle Brown, a longtime confidant of Christie's, who worked in the administration. 
That also indicated to Kelly that Timponi was sent by Christie. In 2016, shortly after Christie lost his bid for president, Timponi surfaced in the news once again when the Republican governor nominated him to the New Jersey Supreme Court. So I got the timeline correct here now, not before. I think we I compressed the timeline before. A Democrat, hmm, Timponi easily won confirmation from the Democratic-controlled state Senate. Timponi will have an unusually short term on the court serving just until next year when he faces the mandatory retirement age of 70. So strategically speaking, not a super smart uh, nomination. There must be some other reason behind it, right? He's been an extraordinarily good friend. And in the business that I'm in, having an extraordinarily good friend is a gift, Christie said when Timponi was sworn in. Having more than a few very good friends is a miracle, he added. Wally Timponi has helped contribute to that miracle for me. How nice. 17 years ago, Timponi was involved in a different Christie-related controversy. After, <clears throat> pardon me, after President George W. Bush appointed Christie as New Jersey's U.S. attorney, the two states, two Democratic senators, uh, at that time, Bob Torricelli and John Corzine, wanted someone with criminal law experience to be Christie's number two in that office, and Timponi was tapped for that job. But then it was revealed that Timponi had visited Torricelli while the senator was under FBI surveillance as part of an investigation into possible campaign finance violations. At the time, Timponi represented another elected official who the FBI wanted to wire in order to record conversations with Torricelli. As a result, Timponi never got the job as Christie's top assistant. But he still worked there somehow, I guess, later. Kelly is still hoping the U.S. Supreme Court might take up her case before she leaves for prison in July. Bill Baroni, Christie's former appointee at the Port Authority, was also convicted in the Bridgegate scheme and is currently serving an 18-month sentence. Fascinating story. I guess corruption is everywhere, and at least among Republicans, and you shouldn't forget it. All right, let's see. What other things might we need to mention, at least briefly today? We didn't get, of course, to the stories that I thought we might have to wait until Thursday for. Anyway, I could have taken the opportunity to jump in on those things, but I guess uh, we'll hold out on that, and maybe we'll just dive in with one last impeachment note from the hill uh the house freedom caucus has voted to condemn justin amish's impeachment comments because of how concerned they are about free speech etc etc of course the conservative house freedom caucus took an official position condemning amish's call for impeaching president trump on monday evening jim jordan had the pleasure of informing reporters we had a good discussion and every single member I think now based on who was there and our board meeting was probably over 30 members, every single member disagrees and strongly with the position Justin took over the week and we're focused on the now, he said. That doesn't mean anything. I mean, look, we're focused on the fact that what the FBI did was wrong. We think that Attorney General Barr's handled himself exactly the way the American people want the Attorney General to handle themselves and he's going to get to the bottom of all this. That's really extraordinarily dumb and dangerous. While members did not discuss whether they should hold a vote to oust Amish from the powerful group, no, he helped found. Many expressed frustrations with his position. Amish said he determined that the president committed impeachable offenses after having read the special counsel report. What do you know? What concerns me is Justin was viewed as a leader, right? On protecting privacy rights first to First Amendment rights, Jordan continued, like the ability to speak out on such things. We had a press conference like a year ago with Rand Paul, Wyden, uh, all on concerns about all civil liberties and how the FISA court operates and what can happen in this whole, you know, this whole area. And now Justin's on the other side, and I just don't understand that, he said, referring to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Very interesting. So I guess, yeah, uh, his approach to this whole thing is that uh, there was a FISA violation here. He's, he's linking everything, hanging his hat on this, the allegation that there was spying on the Trump campaign and that there was this high up um, conspiracy among the Obama administration to spy on the Trump campaign and help the Hillary Clinton campaign because of what a lock everybody thought of. I don't know. You tell me how.
how we could possibly get to that. Anyway, uh, the whole rest of the article is pretty much a clown show, but I suggest that you take a look at it. But just uh, to give you some hint of where the Freedom Caucus is coming from on all this, they're buying into the spying accusation hook, line, and sinker, and they can't believe that one of their members isn't doing that. Very surprising, I guess. Uh, to them. Anyway, next coming up, the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Justice Putnam. Let's see what he'll pick up that we haven't or what he might reiterate. Uh, if you give HUD Secretary <laughs> Ben Carson a lesson on REOs, well, you know, he'll just condescendingly demand a glass of milk. A Senate hearing on agriculture and climate change featured industry speakers but no climate scientists in the Senate. Not a surprise. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy ignored national security risks to help a campaign donor. And ICE just reached a disturbing record as it brazenly exceeds limits set by Congress. More after this. From Daily Coe's Radio on NetworksRadio.com You have been listening to the Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. All right, we may even have time for this. Let's see. Uh, tensions flare between Rome and hardline white nationalist extremists in Hungary. And the South Africa Justice Minister said that the Mozambique ex-finance minister will be extradited home instead of the United States, where he faced charges in a $2 billion debt scandal. 